Uh, okay, so we're looking at a 1992 Lancia Delta HF Integrale Evolucione, uh, commonly referred to as an Integrale Evo. Integrale Evo 1 as opposed to an Integrale Evo 2. So a lot of people out there, uh, if you haven't done your research or if you're a, if you, if you, you're a fan of Rally, but like it's hard to keep up because right, this car's almost 30 years old, a lot of people think, well, the Evo 2 is the widest with the tallest struts, the ultimate version of the car. The Evo 2 and the Evo 1 are actually very, very similar. The difference being this Evo 1 was actually a homologated car, which the Evo 2 was, and the Evo 1, you know, raced uh, in the uh, the sixth time, the sixth consecutive year, actually, that Lancia won the uh, World Rally Championship Constructors uh, title, the Group A title, as they called it back in the day. So, so that's what this car is. It was uh, an amazing achievement, probably, I think, from a lineage perspective. I think the thing that I really love about it, it was a car that really created heroes because um, if you think about like this car was designed in the mid to late 70s wow. uh, it's crazy to think right so and this 1992 model wasn't even the final year technically that the car was produced um, but what you saw it was, it was designed by Ital Design which was a fantastic coachworks and design company in Italy who designed unbelievable cars that you'd be familiar with like for example some people look at this and they say, wow, it looks like a Mark 1 Golf. Designed by the same guy, right? Designed by Giorgetto Giugero. He designed the Mark 1 Golf. He designed uh, crazy things like the Series 1 Lotus Esprit. Uh, he even designed the DeLorean, right? And also, think about anything cool in uh, Italian in the 70s and 80s. Maseratis, Alfa Romeos. He designed them. But of course, the design brief when he originally designed this was not a World Rally Championship winning car. What he was designing was an economy car, uh, you know, that anyone in Italy could afford to buy. It was cheap. Uh, it would have been front wheel drive originally, and you would drive it to, you know, to dinner. You drive it to the grocery store. That, that's what this car was intended for. So if you think uh, all those years later, we get to, you know, the mid 80s, and they start thinking, the engineers start thinking, wow, like, what if we do something interesting with the drivetrain, right? We could do something incredible on different kinds of terrain in a championship, like World Rally Championship, the Group A stage. Uh, that could be great for our brand. We could sell a lot of cars. Um, and what we had, of course, back in that time period, this is when I was a kid, was the idea of, you know, homologation. So if you think about amazing cars like the E30 M3, uh, the 190 Mercedes Cosworth that were racing in DTM at the time. You know, in order to enter a car into a race, the idea was that you also had to make, produce, and sell a certain number of that model of car to members of the public, right? So you could be sitting there on the weekend watching a race, watching your hero drivers in the car. Uh, and then, you know, on Monday, you could go to the dealership and the car, it's sitting here, like, right? here in Rad Garage, you can see the car, it'd have a price ticket on it. It might be, it might have a more civilized interior, right, than the one that your heroes are racing on the weekend, but ultimately it is the, you know, World Rally Championship car. So, 1992, Lancia at this point had won five Group A Constructors Championships on the trot, and I mean, you had no business winning that many championships on, on the trot, right? You're competing with fantastic cars that are in that series, like the Sierra, Ford Sierra Cosworth was in there, uh, the Toyota Celica GT4 was racing, um, you know, the Audi 90, 90 Quattro was racing, and this was a car that was coming to the end of its life, right? Like, no business. So, but what it had was incredible drivers, right? They had a whole series of drivers and they would select a driver based on uh, the course that they were gonna be racing, you know, this weekend, for example. Um, so fun fact, in 1992, I would argue they won Group A by the skin of their teeth, right? You had uh, Yuha Kankanen, very famous racing driver. You had uh, Didier Aurelier, who was a fantastic driver, but neither of them won the championship. They came second and third, right, to Carlos Sainz. Carlos Sainz blew him away for consistency in the Celica GT4. 
But of course, with those two amazing drivers racking up points across the whole season, Lancia, again, they won six consecutive Group A World Championship title. And actually, fun fact, that makes this car, uh, and I can say this with no ego, because of course I had no, I didn't build this car, right? But what I love about it is that it's actually the most successful racing car of any series of all time because of what they were able to do. And I think that's a fantastic feat. And I don't know, you know, that's part of why I want to buy this car is because arguably I'd say this is a better car to own, you know, in the year 2021 than it was the day it came out. I'll, I can talk about that a bit more and why, why that's my opinion. But also it's this cherished thought of like, owning this little bit of my heroes right from my childhood. Yeah, so 1993, right, year after this car. Uh, so Lancia was still selling the Evolucioni car that year, but no, there was no works team anymore, right? 1992 was the Martini works team. Most people will know this car being in white with the Martini color livery, right? Incredibly beautiful, arguably one of the best libraries of all time. Um, 1993, a non-works team was raced it, they did not win anything. 1994, Lancia, serious financial difficulties, right? So as a marketing exercise, they made the Evoluzioni 2. Yeah, very similar car, right? They did things like, just very subtle things to distinguish it. They painted these, right? Like they, they put different seats in it. They gave it a little bit more power, but also smaller turbo, so it would spool up faster. Uh, they put a catalytic converter on it because, of course, emissions were becoming a problem at a time, and no team picked up the Evolucioni 2. Uh, so it's a fantastic car to own. From a pedigree perspective, when I was looking for a car, I really wanted this. Uh, I was lucky enough to come across this Evolucioni. And of course, the reason is the car was end of life, right? So in 1993, those two drivers I just told you about went to Toyota and won to the championship in the Celica GT4. So they blew the non-works Lancia Delta Integrale team. So when I say this is a car that made heroes, it, you know, uh, it really was. It, they shone in this car, and then they went into the Celica GT4. It was te technically a superior car, right? And they, and they blew everyone away. And then of course, you, the Escort Cosworths come along, you know, the Subaru Impreza comes along. In 93, you had the Lancer Evolution. In 94, you've got Evolution 2, and of course we're also familiar with you know the pedigree of those cars and where they come from, and they were just the next leap, right? The next generation in chassis development and, and drivetrain development over and above this. Um, you know, I say I think arguably a better car uh, to own uh, and drive on the road these days than maybe it was when it was new, but you know, can you imagine? in 1992 and even earlier right because you could buy you know Lancia Delta Integrales with maybe slightly less power slight less difference in you know the late 80s early 90s can you imagine having a hatchback with 200 horsepower you know in in that time period you, you literally own a rocket ship right a, a, a total you know um, wolf in sheep's clothing if you like right so uh, I think that the development of cars is fantastic um, things are getting so much power now, like even some of our daily drivers, right? It's so normal to have three, 400 horsepower and amazing traction. But I think what makes driving really um, enjoyable, at least on the road, if you're, if you're not lucky enough to have like a great circuit that you've got access to or something, right? And you've got to enjoy a Sunday morning road, you know, or a late evening drive, you want to go for a 30, 45 minute squirt in your fun car you know, on a, on a Wednesday evening or something like that. You know, what you what you really like to do is drive, you know, a, a slow car quite quickly, you know, as opposed to this incredible, exotic, super fast, like prancing horse car. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to own those cars. Um, you know, if someone offered me like, I don't know, a 488 Pista, if someone wants to give me that for this, I'll take that deal all day long. But in reality, I'm probably gonna have more fun driving this on my favorite roads. Uh, Maybe not at the ragged edge, right? But I'm gonna have more fun driving this. So this car has been tuned to uh, around 270 horsepower with some supporting, some supporting modifications for that. Tire technology is a lot better than it was now when this car was new, right? So I've got Dunlop de Rezas on 17 inch wheels. This car originally actually came on uh, 15 inch, 16 inch wheels. 
Um, no, 15 inch wheels, the, the OEM wheels for the Evolucioni. So, I mean, the amount of traction that you get um, on this car is just enough to give you a ton of confidence, but not quite so much that you can't get to that sort of like seven, eight tenths in it and really enjoy yourself, right? It's absolutely fantastic. Uh -huh. Uh, and that's a trend that you see a lot of people hopping on now is uh, drive a slow car fast. Yeah. I've been, just in the last couple of days on the internet, since I've had a yeah. new car in my garage, I've heard a lot of chat about that, right? Yeah. And even if you look at the new Supra, yeah. it's not 505 horsepower. You no, know, people, I think if you, look, if you look at the cars winning uh, many awards now, right? Like you go back and you watch like Evo Magazine Car of the Year, um, you know, the, the cars. Not always, but like this year, uh, M2 CS won it. I mean, you could argue that's a car with a lot of power, right? It's got like over 400 horsepower and so on. But you can get on the ragged edge because it's got rear wheel drive, so it's willing to show you a lack of grip, right? You can really get, you know, the arguably, in my mind, like the best driver's car that anyone can go out and, and arguably the best value too right now is, uh, is a Cayman GT4, right? One of either of those generations. And you're talking about a car that's got high you know almost 400 horsepower but ultimately what makes it great is a fantastic sounding engine Carrera S engine but what makes it really great is um, you know GT aerodynamic and handling characteristics that you can exploit on the road you know maybe at five six thousand rpm maybe higher if you're really out in the, in the country uh, without you know really threatening anyone or without you know being a complete lunatic so i think that's what's fun right and this one of course you can access that much easier right like you've got you know only the same amount of power in this car that you have in a modern day golf gti but it also weighs a ton less right and you can really feel the steering is much better so yeah. okay so i've got i've got my hand held here now so yeah. nick why don't you take us around tell us some of the favorite features you have of this little hot hatch you've got <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, when, <laughs> when Ital Design were designing this car in the late 70s, they, they didn't have these swollen uh, fenders in mind, right? Like, this is something that came later. And I would say my favourite feature of the car, the car is, I, I believe it's 5.7 inches wider uh, body-wise, yeah. like, shared between both sides of the car, so you can see the front fender yeah. swollen here and of course the rear fender yeah. and what makes the Evolucioni really special is that the swelling goes almost all the way up the yeah. rear passenger side door and all the way to the yeah. back of the car whereas on some early Integrales it only came to here and so on so it's one of my favorite features um, one of the things I really love about this car although it's not incredibly practical is that we've got these group A spec carbon mirrors yeah. which are not particularly useful um, in most traffic situations. I usually find myself hunting and pecking They're around the car, small. Right? like trying to look for um, a little bit of extra visibility. Um, but I think it's fantastic, really cool. So um, unique. Previous owner of this car um, came across these fantastic um, mag forged magnesium 17 inch Oz Speedline wheels. Um, which are absolutely incredible. So of course these cars originally came with steel wheels. Um, most of, I think every Integrale I've ever seen at a car show, they do have a replica of this wheel, which is 17 inch, it's a cast steel replica version of it. But this has these lighter, very period correct um, magnesium wheels in it, which... Uh, yeah, now speaking as a detailer, I don't appreciate these wheels very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're beautiful, but... <laughs> Oh. There's a lot of surface to clean there, but they sure look good. I don't think they I've look ever, good on this car. I don't think I've ever cleaned them in the time I've been <laughs> I just spray the hose off. Yeah, well, luckily uh, I've got a few brushes, so I was able to get in there. So we can open up the hood and I can show yeah. you, but um, specifically, this car sits a little lower than people might typically see with um, an Integrale if you're looking at like period rally pictures. So interestingly, you know, things to you know about rally is that different. Um, stages would have very different setups for the car, right? Like, for example, if you're in Corsica, and like the badge I've got in front of this car, you're going to be, uh, you know, on asphalt, right? So you're going to want more of a, you know, typical motorsport racing track ride height, which is what you see on this car now. So suspension, 
setup that we currently have in this car, uh, which is fully adjustable, um, is, is configured to have this car set at a tarmac height, which is of course where, you know, most of what I'm uh, spending my time doing. So. so this engine has been fully rebuilt um, under my ownership. So the oh, thing yeah? about, yeah, the thing about cars of this age, right? So, so this was a, an Italian built Integrale, as they all were, uh, built by the factory, as opposed to being built, um, you know, by a coachworks company as they were towards the end of their life when Lancia were really struggling. And um, Majora, the name of that coachworks company for any, anyone out there who's interested, they, uh, they sit, right? So this car was built, it was exported to Japan. And as many of us know, Japan is a bit of a mecca to go for cars that we traditionally think are now all rusted and they're gone, right, long gone, um, because of the very dry climate that they have in Japan, but also incredibly, I would argue, the most strict possible safety and mechanical standards to keep a, a car that's over a few years old on the road. It's very expensive to keep and running old cars, which is why you typically don't see a lot of old cars on the road just in your day-to-day -day in Japan. Um, they tend to sit. So this car was purchased um, by the original owner in Canada about 10 years ago. He purchased it from the original owner in Japan, which is oh, fantastic because wow. a lot of Japanese cars come through the car auction. Um, so what he was able to do is understand the full history of the car. And this car had been sitting right for a really long time. So he brought the car to Canada, uh, drove it a couple of times, He's known for bringing lots of fantastic, you know, exotic cars and things that we don't really get in this market over to Canada. But of course it sits, so this car's only got 54,000 kilometers on it um, in its whole lifetime, which is why it's in such fantastic condition. But of course, you know, seals go. Yeah. You know, engines don't like to sit, yeah. right? So uh, it went to a second owner. And that second owner owned it until about four years ago when I bought it. And fun story, actually, I had been uh, working on another project car of mine a number of years ago, and I was selling some car parts. And uh, I, you know, met uh, the previous owner of this car. You know, selling him some seats, and he'd done a ton of work to this car. A lot of you know, the things like the suspension and the wheels, and like yeah, replacing some interior bits um, so that they look absolutely brand new. Um, we'll open the doors in a minute and you can take some um, some footage of like the door sills. Like everything is brand new in the car. It looks like it could be in the showroom tomorrow, right? And no one would ever know it's been sat in before. Um, but what hadn't been taken care of in this car, um, and something that I um, fell victim of is, you know, engine maintenance. Not that any, while it was being driven, it had been taken care of. Um, the top end of the motor was actually in fantastic condition, but unfortunately I bust a bearing in this car a couple of years ago. And, uh, and so we, we, we went down the road of having to do a full uh, dismant, uh, dismantle of this uh, engine bay, engine out, went to a Lancia professional who completely rebuilt it, wow. shipped it away. Um, Is that right? To a, you know, yeah, fantastic builder of these engines named Yuri, who runs a company called Projo in Holland. Um, he did a fantastic rebuild of the motor and created it back to me. And, uh, and then my good friends at Compact Tuning Lab here in, uh, in Calgary put it all back together for me. Um, we made some decisions along the way uh, in the motor rebuild as well. Uh, you know, we used some materials that just weren't available at the time, right? So um, one of the things that these engines really suffer from, from a reliability perspective, is maintaining oil pressure, right? So we had the top of the deck completely skimmed. We used things like MLS gaskets as opposed to the more traditional gaskets that, you know, even today. So, you know, I like to say, you know, for anyone who's shopping for a car, and it doesn't just have to be an Integrale, but like any sort of 30-year-old car that probably hasn't, been driven regularly in 20 years, you know, go in eyes wide open. Prepare yourself. Expect that no matter how it, good it sounds, right, when it starts up, no matter yeah. how low the miles are on the odometer, you know, uh, you're gonna, someone in, in the life of, in the next five years of that car, someone, whether it's you or the next owner 
uh, or the previous owner who's done it before you've got it is going to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on something like this, um, you know, to make it a reliable driver that you can, you know, take out for coffee and things like that whenever you want. That maintains its pressure. That's got all of this boost. And uh, one of the really cool things is um, another uh, guy I know relatively locally who has uh, a car very similar to this. Um, drove my car um, last summer and was totally happy with his own Integrale, right? Like, thought uh -oh. it was the bee's knees. Right. Uh, drove right, everything, everything about it was great. And he got in my car after its rebuild and uh, he took it for a 10 minute spin and uh, went home, uh, took his car to my uh, mechanic, compact tuning lab, and ordered them to completely tear it down um, and rebuild the car. Uh, he, his comment was, wow, like, your car is as smooth as, you know, a brand new Golf R off the lot, right? Uh, feels like a brand new car to drive, like smooth, instant power boost, once you get into the right part of the rev range, how did you do it? You know, and the answer is, you know, 200 things. Right? Yeah. Like get 200 things right. Um, everything from how we're keeping pressure uh, in the engine, you know, how we removed that completely unnecessary balance shafts from the motor to increase oil pressure to where it should have been, you know, how we modified you know, the oil pan to make sure the oil can't slosh around and the engine can't take in air instead of oil, all the way down to, you know, axle seals being replaced, uh, an alignment being set up exactly as it should be, you know, for this car and, and, and to manage its weight properly. So Incredible, Nick. What, what is this engine? Yeah, so this is a two litre inline four uh, dual overhead cam 16 valve uh, motor. Yep and um, it's got a big turbo on it. So fun fact, like Evolucioni has a big turbo on it. Evolucioni 2 has a small turbo on it. Technically produces more power because of a tune that they put in it, um, but is cap not, not so capable, right, from a tuning perspective. The potential of Ev Evolucioni 2 because of that is, uh, is a little less. So, this has this big motor and what we've trained this one to do right through the power of tuning is to uh, get into the boost really quick. So what's fun about this car is that you get into that rev, uh, you, you, you go through the rev range and there's not much there. You get to 3000 RPM, it hits you like a ton of bricks, right? right. Like it actually hits you. You know, I've owned, not anymore, I've owned a, you know, a W205 C63S and when twin, turbo, twin turbos kick in on a, four litre V8 and it throws you back violently into your seat. You get almost like almost that same sensation of instant talk, uh, talk with this car that you do with some uh, modern day cars. So it feels fantastic to drive around. Is it a high revving engine? Not particularly. Uh, no, certainly not by today's standards. I think that, you know, myself, I don't drive the nuts off this thing, right? But you can really enjoy this car between about three and 5,000 RPM. Right be enjoying it. And in fact, you know, one of the roads that I regularly do on sort of Sunday morning coffees and things like that, some of my friends, like my friend Rob, is like a really great, you know, 4.2 litre V8 RA, you know. And one of my friends is a, a beautiful, you know, dare of a 993 4S. Um, and, you know, it's very capable of keeping up with a wide range of cars, you know, under, under mod, modern, you know, motoring conditions, right, with these tyres that are on it. Like, nothing really leaves it behind. None of my friends have crazy things, though, right, like Ford GTs or Ferraris or anything like that. So it hasn't been tested against those kinds of cars. If you look at well, things like that, the, just from a condition perspective, yeah. right, you can really see if you ignore the mats for a second, how clean these cells are. Um, so these are actually a pretty rare um, le black leather perforated seat option, which I think are just fantastic. And I mean, they're just really of the period. Yeah, I've never seen a seat like that in a car. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a massage chair. Yeah. Wow. Um, it actually holds you in really well. It's a Ricaro okay. seat. If you look, it's, it's got Ricaro, yeah. you know, labeling on the underneath yeah, of it. Yeah, we could see that, Ricaro. Yeah. And um, 
The previous owner had done this Group A style um, tall uh, short shifter uh, right there in the centre, which is a joy to use. Right, it's really a really a you know harking back to the you know yeah. elements of the car. And, and yeah, rally. gives it that rally. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing it with me and letting me wash it. Now, uh, yeah, thanks for taking so yeah. care of it. I'll check, check this detail out, actually. I think I should do this the other day. But like, what I, one of the fun things I love about this car is, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a person that doesn't like people slamming your doors, you can just click it closed almost like a jewelry <laughs> box, right? Which is probably more a testament to how thin the metal work is than it is uh, a design feature. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, uh, it's a real experience uh, hanging out with this car. And I know my Instagram followers and YouTube viewers are going to really uh, <laughs> comment below, guys. I know this is a car that means a lot to a lot of people around the world. It's a global car. And I really love these Euro, are those Euro blades OEM? Yeah, so these are that brand is new. such a good. I mean, we didn't talk about details, but yeah. these are brand new replacement um wipers that are <laughs> i won't tell you how no. much i paid yeah your, um, your wife might be listening we for these, but yeah we could, we could have probably had a couple of nights in disney world for what those well are. those are the nicest uh <laughs> nicest wiper arms i've ever seen yeah i yeah. couldn't believe that and i think like one of my favorite features of this car from stock to are these these spot lamps which yeah. you know parking back again right we talked about um about Ital design and how they designed the you know the, the Mark One Volkswagen Golf and, and there you see it right like this is of yep. that era. Yep. Right? Um, one of the things that we've done on this car too is we don't quite can't quite get back far enough, but you see the mm -hmm. enormous radiator, yep. um, which keeps this really cool. Obviously not a stock item, but is you know an item that I think is really important because one of the most important things that you can do with. Uh, I'm not going to say cars of this period because it just really depends, but with this car, right, it gets very hot under there. Yeah. So you really want to expel as much temperature and keep that temperature down as low as possible. So for me, you know, it's not about keeping everything completely as stock. It's really about thinking like, what would they have done, right, from a, a, a mechanical perspective uh, if they had access yeah. to things that were available now? Right, in, in 2020, 2021. Yep. Um, and also, if money was no object, right? Because, of course, you know, yep. we know that they're doing what they can, you know, within a cost of goods budget to build a car. So, well, thanks very much, Nick. Um, yeah, real pleasure. I think people are going to get a real kick out of this and enjoy it in good health and good spirits. I know you do. I see you on Instagram <laughs> all the time taking this thing out for brunch. <laughs> <laughs>